Hey guys, it's Ed from Loose Pixel, and today I want to take care of your body, not your mind, which is what I usually do when I talk about, when I do my art talks where I'm talking about navigating the emotional stresses of a professional art career. Today I want to talk about your physical self, because I would say a good 9 out of 10 artists, despite their general knowledge of human anatomy, know really little to nothing when it comes to their physical health, their physical body, their medical health. And as such, I've seen artists from concept artists, illustrators, fine artists, tattoo artists, you name it, ruin their body with bad habits. And being somebody who's approaching 50 years old, I'm 47 at the time of this recording, and who's dealt with recurring back injuries, hip problems, arm problems, and in the last year and a half to two years, debilitating chronic back, butt, and leg pain caused by things I'm going to share with you. I've learned a lot. I have watched thousands of videos on phys physiotherapy, osteopathy, uh, uh, training, stretching, yoga, strengthening, everything in order to get over my chronic pain. I found the solutions. I, I decoded the puzzle of my own body. And today is me paying it forward by sharing this information with you so you can prevent injury and or heal injury. Now, of course, I can't cover the whole body and this isn't, I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't cover all of these different medical aspects of things, but I do know my shit pretty well. I do have a great passion for medicine and for anatomy, not only from a teacher's perspective, but from a general function perspective as well, and from, a, from an ergonomics perspective. So today I just want to focus on this section of the body, which will com comprise of the lumbar spine, the lower back, the hips, the, the hips and the legs and the pelvis. Okay. Muscular, nerve, all of the above. And um, I'm going to start, I actually have a checklist of things here because it took some time to organize all of this information. Note, I'm not going to take it easy on you today. So grab a pencil and paper. You might need to watch this video four or five times over to absorb all this information. Of course, it's not a full body anatomy lesson like I would do in my art classes. This is me just focusing on certain specific things. So I've broken it up into different categories. I'm gonna start by explaining human anatomy, or at least the anatomy of the section. And we're gonna start with the bones. So the first primary bones that I wanna focus on today are the spine. If you're looking at the actual spine, also known as the spinal column, the reason it's called a spinal column is because it's a column of spines. These are called spines, these little protrusions of bone. We have some on the side, and we have little muscles that are connected to each one of these that help us with bending our body sideways. And we have the spinous process in the back. Process just means a, a, bo a protrusion of bone that's sticking out like that. The spinous process that go right down the back that you can feel with your hand if you rub your hand down your back. Okay, it's these, these are little bumps that you're feeling. From the front view or the quote anterior view, we have the vertebrae themselves and we have discs in the middle, which a lot of people, physiotherapists and doctors, to simplify it, they'll refer to it as kind of like a jelly-filled donut uh, because it's got a, a liquid interior that allows some absorbency and shock, okay? So it's more specifically a disc made of very strong interlocking fibers that has a liquid-filled interior for that shock absorbency. And over time, if you have improper posture, that those fibers can weaken and that core, that what's called the nucleus pulposa, can pop through and that can cause problems, which I've dealt with recurring quite seriously throughout my life. And I'll get into more depth about that in a sec. Now, in the middle, if you look down from a top-down view of the spine, you have your central nervous system, or at least you have the nerve root that travels right down the middle of your spine. So your spine is actually housing nerves that go straight from the brain all the way down the spine, all the way down to the base of your sacrum. And then they travel down your legs from there. And between each one of these vertebrae, you can see these little holes, this little space where my finger is right there. Okay. This is referred to as a foramen. A foramen in anatomical terms means a hole. Okay. So if you look at the opening of your pelvis over here. This is a male pelvis over here. This is what would be referred to as your obturator foramen. Okay, so it's the foramen of your pelvis. Here, 
we have the foramen, the holes between the vertebrae, also referred to technically, medically, as your intervertebral foramen, meaning the holes between your vertebrae. And you'll notice that at each one of these, going all the way down, you can see all these little yellow things sticking out here. This is just shortened versions of them, of course. You can see nerves that branch off from this nerve root and travel out the sides. And this is where the, this is how the nerves travel through your body, through your arms, through your ribs, your organs, and in this particular case, down your legs. Okay, in all these different branching areas. And nerves serve different purposes, which I'll get to in a sec. Then, from there, we also have facet joints. These are the two joints in the back. So basically, the spine is connected. It's jointed in the back, and it's moving up and down here in the front. Okay, so that allows me to bend back and bend forward in all different directions. So what I, the takeaway I want you to get from this is where the joint is, where these holes are, and the disc itself, because these are things you're gonna need to take very good care of and be conscious of in your movements. Next, we have the bones of the pelvis. So te technically, if we're looking at the spine, we have four different sections of the spine. Cervical, meaning neck, so a cervix, a cervical means neck, okay? Thoracic, meaning chest region. So we have the cervical spine, which is seven vertebrae, C1 to, uh, um, uh, C1 to C7. Then we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, T1 to T12, counting from top to bottom. We have five lumbar, which are these five, one, two, one, one, two three, four, five, L1 to L5. And then last we have our sacrum, which is the final part, the kind of the junction point between the base of the spine and the pelvis over here, okay? The sacrum has five vertebrae, but as you can see, they're fused together to create this big triangular shaped bone. And at the tip of that, right at the base here, is the coccyx bone. These strings are just elastics to hold the legs in place, okay? Now what makes up the pelvis are the ilium, these two wing-shaped large bones that make up the ilium, and the sacrum, which is technically part of the spine, which makes up the middle, and they join together at the sacroiliac joint. One here and one over here, also known as the SI joint, okay? Then, if we look on the outside, and they also, by the way, these two bones are actually separated, and they meet together here at the front, which is the pubis bone, which is located just above the genitals, okay? So if you look at where the genitals are, the pubis bone's right above that, okay? Then we have our leg bones. I'm not gonna get too much into the detail of the legs, but we basically have the head. The, there's the joint over here, which is the acetabulum, the socket joint that our leg moves inside, the neck, and the greater trochanter of the femur, okay? Not gonna get into too much detail about the legs, I really wanna focus on this area. So that makes up the main bony parts we're gonna be looking at today. Then we have the muscles. So we have different groups of muscles that control this area and are involved in our conversation today that you need to learn and be conscious of because these are muscles that might be too strong, too tight, too weak, etc., or might have a discrepancy in them that can lead to injury. And when I'm saying injury, I'm not saying, ow, it can be that way, but usually an injury around that area is debilitating, as in you cannot move, and the pain in this area is easily a 55 on 10. It is excruciatingly painful. You don't want to go through it. And if you have, I'm sure you can attest to what I'm saying right now. So, the main muscles of the back, we have muscles that flex the skeleton and muscles that extend the skeleton. Okay, extending meaning standing up, flexing meaning closing the skeleton. The muscles that are involved in extension of the spine are primarily the rectus spinatus, meaning the straight muscles of the lower back, and they travel right up the back. We have two sets of muscles that connect to the back, or a couple of muscles that actually connect to the bottom ribs, which are located around here, and they connect from here to the back of the pelvis, and that's known as our QL muscle, which is short form for quadratus lumborum, meaning four muscles of the, of the lumbar spine, and all of these are connected to each vertebrae over here. Then, the most important ones in this particular case is we have our latissimus muscles, our lats, which are the big, mu the big back muscles that give you the big V-shaped back. But those muscles actually connect all here 
to the inside of the sacrum and along the outside. The tendons and ligaments are all connecting here to the back of the sacrum and the lower spine. So you can see its involvement in lower back. And uh, then we have the big powerful muscles, the gluteus maximus muscles. And the gluteus maximus muscles are the largest and most superficial muscles in this area of the body. Very big, very massive muscles. At least they should be. Okay. Then on the sides over here, for sidewards, for lateral movement of the leg, is our gluteus medius muscles. Now, all of these work together in unison, but the muscles that are more involved in lifting the leg to the side and controlling the side is the gluteus medius, and in the back, it's the gluteus maximus. All right? So these are the main muscles involved in extension. There's actually one more muscle that actually connects here to the bottom of the ischium. This is the ischium of the pelvis right over here, if I can turn it around like that. These are our, quote, sit bones. So if you're a cyclist, for instance, when you're getting, when you're actually getting your bicycle seat measured, you want to measure the distance between here and here. Generally on a woman, it's going to be a little bit wider than that of a male because of childbirth, okay, particularly after puberty. Pre-puberty is very difficult to tell the difference between a male and a female pelvis, albeit there are little ways of knowing. And if we move to the front, and if we look from the back there, we have our hamstrings that are connected to the back here and they connect to the back of the leg. So they also are very important in extending our, our ups, us straight. So if I'm standing straight, I want my gluteus muscles and my hamstring muscles to be involved in that process the most. I don't want my lower back muscles to be involved in that, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, flexion muscles of the core. Um, the first, the deep muscles, there's a muscle that's connected all along the inside of the spine over here, all here, and it's all connected to all these different vertebrae, and there's a second head of it that's all connected to the inside of the ilium, and they merge together and travel through the pelvis and connect to the inside of the femur over here, and that's known as our iliopsoas muscle, ilio referring to the ilium part portion of it, and the psoas referring to this part of the spine over here, and they're connecting to the front of the pelvis. So you can see how that muscle is involved in doing this kind of a movement to the pelvis. Okay. Then we have in the, uh, the front here, we have our hip flexors, which generally consist of our rectus femoris, which is the muscle that goes straight down the middle of our leg from our hip right down to our knee, and our TFL, which is connected here in the front and connects to the outside of the knee, also referred to as our ten tensor fascia lata, which is a short muscle that's connected to a long band of fascia that actually connects all of these muscles together. So the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and the TFL are all merging together into a band of fascia that's very powerful. It can support up to a thousand pounds, and that travels all the way down the outside of your leg to the, the outside of your leg down to your knee, to the outside of your knee, and it's what assists in help, helping to stabilize and keeping you in a straight position. These are the main muscles we're going to be focusing on today that are involved. This is the ones that you're going to be paying close attention to. Uh, then we have nerves, okay? And again, we have, we have many, many nerves in the body. I don't want to get into details, but the ones that I want you to focus on today that are the most important are the ones that are traveling outside the lumbar spine and the ones that are traveling through the pelvis into the butt and legs. And there's actually five nerves here, or at least five nerve stems that originate from L3, so L1, uh, L3, 4, and 5, and S1 and 2. Those five nerves merge together to create the largest by a long shot, nerve of the human body, known as the sciatic nerve. So if you've ever heard of, if you've ever had or have heard of sciatica, they're referring to nerve pain there. But you can see that this nerve is originating here at the lumbar spine, okay? They merge together, they travel through this hole over here, referred to as the greater sciatic notch, and travels all the way down the leg, all the way down into the feet, and the, all the way back up into the groin. All of the nerves that are happening here at the lumbar spine and the sacrum control many different functions of the lower body, anywhere from lower back movement to bladder control to the controlling every single muscle in the legs, front, back, superficial and, and deep. Superficial means on the surface and deep meaning closer to the bone all the way down to the feet and the toes, all the way into the groin, okay? And again, this is important because it's going to help you understand, to diagnose, to understand what's going on in your body depending on the different circumstances and stuff like that. Um, so those are the main nerves. And you can also see that we've also got nerves here at the base of the sacrum that are also traveling in here behind this SI joint. You can see this is the back of the ilium over here. 
And this is the SI joint. Oh yeah, and another quick thing when it comes to bones, just to mention, as far as the structure of the bones, we have two bumpy protrusions here in the front of the ilium and two on the back. This is known as the spine, the iliac spine. Over here, spine just means a ridge, okay? And here at the front, we have two, two, two important prom uh, prominences that are sticking out in the front and two in the back. This is known as our ASIS and AIIS, meaning anterior superior iliac spine, meaning front top, and then anterior inferior iliac spine. And our rectus femoris muscle, the one I was talking about, originates here at the AIIS, the anterior inferior iliac spine, and our sartorius muscle, which is another other important hip flexor, originates there and goes all the way across the inside into the inside of the knee that originates over here. On the back, we have our PSIS and PIIS, meaning posterior superior, posterior inferior iliac spine. Very important. Now, there are different causes of pain in the human body. The first being, the most common, just from wear and tear, muscular pain. So you, you're exercising your biceps and they, you know, it's the first time you worked out and they, they, they really get kind of inflamed because you just worked out for the first time. So you get really sore muscles. So um, general muscle pain can be you cycled for the first time. You went for a run for the first time. You did your abs for the first time. You went to the gym for the first time. And they're just general workout soreness. You work out your back for the first time and your butt hurts and your back hurts. That's totally normal. That's totally cool. You can pull a muscle, so you can get a muscle tear, which makes it extremely difficult to move. And generally that's an injury, so it's going to be much more painful in that regard. Um, you can get weakness issues. So if I have muscles in my body that are weak, that's going to cause other parts of my body to compensate. That can put extra strain on my skeletal system. Which, so muscles, when you're thinking about muscles, think about skeletal muscles in this particular case. There's organ muscles, like the heart is an organ, for instance, but you have skeletal muscles, which are the ones that control, that help to support and help to move the skeleton, okay? Um, and then you can have what's called fascial problems. And fascial medicine is actually something that's being looked into more and more. It's a bit of, a, a bit of an ignored and overlooked important facet of pain, of chronic pain in the body. Our body is wrapped in this bodysuit of fascia that where ironically all of most of our nerve endings travel through our fascia. And it's kind of ironic how a lot of a lot of medical doctors would discard the fascia, almost kind of like being just the wrapping of the body. When in fact, a lot of chronic pain can be a result of that. And a lot of forward thinking uh, uh, um, physiotherapists and doctors are starting to look more and study more about fascia nowadays because that can be a core of certain problems as well. I'm not gonna get into fascia so much today though because it's a very, different and very unique subject as far as that goes. Then there are bone causes of pain. So aging, getting older, or sometimes even when you're young, you can get inflammation of the bones. And this is what's referred to as arthritis. So you can get, dis you can get distortion, you can get growths in the bones itself, and that ends up putting a lot of strain on joints, and stuff like that. And you can get that anywhere in the body. You've you might have seen grandma or grandpa with their big knuckles. I've got a lot of arthritis in, the, in my family. My mother and my grandmother both had arthritis as far as that goes. And that can cause pains and joints to, to not move properly or to cause uh, just general localized pain as far as that goes. You can get what's called arthrosis. Arthrosis means narrowing of certain canals. So for instance, if we're looking at our spine, we have our intervertebral foramen, and then we have our the foramen in the middle that the, the actual, I can't remember what this, it's the central foramen, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but this foramen as well, we can get arthritic growths around there, we can get general aging, we can get degeneration of these facet joints, which causes those discs to start to pinch down, and that can close the hole and put pressure against the nerve, and that's called arthrosis. Not to be mistaken with arthritis, because they sound very similar. We can get, like I mentioned before, disc degeneration. So these facet joints can start to get worn out over time, right? Disc degeneration can also refer, that's actually, actually joint degeneration, but we can get the degeneration of this disc in general. So that means that this disc over time just gets so worn out over time through many different reasons, which I'll explain in a bit, that can actually lead to the de degeneration of those discs, causing those vertebrae to collapse, impinging on nerves as well. Okay, and degeneration can also be caused by just bad body mechanics. You just do shit wrong, which I did a lot in my life, dancing and, you know, all kinds of crap. I really put a lot of abuse on the body. Now, there are, in that, very often in the same general areas, in the back, in the pelvis, we can also get 
organ issues, which can be confused with other ones. And it's very important if you're not sure, or if you're dealing with really, really severe pain, stop the video, go to the doctor now, because it's not something you can joke around with. Some of these can be life-threatening potentially, right? So for instance, a kidney stone. You have our kidneys in the back here, our renals as well. And we have two from the kidneys. They're basically what filter our blood and clean out our blood. And it's also what filters through into the urine and our, and our urine is basically our body discarding uh, impurities in our blood and impurities in our system. And that filters through two tubes that travel down to the bladder called the ureters. And we, sometimes you can get little bits of calcium deposit, little crystals that can actually form in the kidneys uh, due to whatever little impurities and that can cause stones. And that's where you get kidney stones. And that can travel down and create horrifying pain sometimes that travels, that can travel all the way down there, all the way through the urethra and out of the bladder, and then you go pee, and hopefully you pass it naturally, but that doesn't always happen, right? It can be really, really terrible pain as far as I know. I've never actually had kidney stones, so I'm not sure. Uh, then we can have pains of our organs. So if it's if it's pancreatic or if it's or if it's gallbladder, it's probably a it's most likely a pain that's up here, and it can be very acute, sharp pain, but sometimes there's no pain at all. Sometimes it's just nausea, sometimes you're just really tired things like that. If there's impurities in the system, you can start jaundicing a little bit, meaning your, your skin can discolor a little bit and get a bit yellow because it's not, your, your body's not expelling toxins fast enough. If you move further down, more into this area, and this is where people very often tend to get confused, you can have, if you're a male, you can have, especially if you're older, you're more susceptible to a, to a, an enlarged prostate, which is a gland that actually produces semen in a male. And if that, that prostate can swell over time, it can lead to urination issues. And if it really gets big and really gets bad, um, then that can actually put pressure against the bones. And a prostate can grow quite huge and can become quite a problem. So that's why it's very important to get prostate exams later on in life. Uh, uh, you can get uh, vaginal or ovarian cysts. So you can actually have a cyst that can grow inside the vagina or the ovary itself can get inflamed and that can grow. And I've heard of, I've heard of cysts, vaginal cysts that could be the size of like apples almost. They're massive. And you can imagine that since that's happening down here in this area, this can cause back or front pain as well. You can get uh, testicular pains. And testicular pain can very often, you can have a, a rupture of a testicle, you can get kicked in the nuts, that'll always hurt. But you can also get things, you also have the, the kind of vein that travels from the testicle that wraps around it that can get that can get a torsion in it or get a blockage and that's the blockage of it's kind of basically i think it's called vas vas difference uh, uh blockage or torsion that can twist up and cause a lot of pain down here so you might be sitting there shit my back or my hips or my pelvis hurts i think i pulled my back when in fact it might be an organ issue or something else and that's why when you walk in and complain about back pain the doctor wants to screen for different types of tests to find out what the issue is they'll, they'll do different types of tests which we'll talk about in a sec you can get pain from hormonal or autoimmune issues for instance something i have hypothyroidism which means a low functioning thyroid or hyper and over functioning thyroid that can cause body pains that can make it harder for your body to recover from injury. You can get menstrual cramps. You can have psoriasis. Now psoriasis, which I also have a little bit of as well, is an inflammation of the skin, but a lot of people don't realize that psoriasis actually works under the skin as well. It's an autoimmune, it's just like the thyroid, It's an, or at least the thyroid can be an autoimmune disease, and that would be called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, if it's a hyperactive thyroid, it can be Graves' Uh, disease, which is which is indicative of an overactive thyroid, but that can cause body pain. Uh, psoriasis can cause body pain. It can you also can get, get a thing called psoriatic arthritis. So if you have psoriasis and you have bone pains, that bone pain can actually be related to psoriasis because psoriasis tends to get it tends to uh, affect joints, elbows, knees, etc. And those are all areas of high mobility, as far as that goes. Diabetes can cause pain. Vitamin deficiencies can cause pain. Dehydration, an infection, uh, or more serious medical emergencies as well. Now, when it comes to pain itself and diagnosing pains and stuff like that, even though a lumbar or a pelvic herniation or an offset or a nerve irritation can be debilitatingly painful, I've been through it, it's not necessarily a medical emergency. It's just extremely painful because 
uh, because you're putting pain directly on a nerve. You've, you've got a herniated disc leaning directly on a nerve. Um, but most of the time, this is usually just a herniation issue. It's a disc bulge issue or something like that, which I'll explain in detail in a sec. However, that's, that's why this lumbar area or even the cervical area is a more explainable and a more common place for injury because the lower back and the neck are areas that get the most movement. Your thoracic spine, however, the region around your rib cage, is not supposed to move that much. So if you're having really bad pain in your lower back or somewhere else in your back, that can often be a little bit more of a red flag than a lumbar pain injury because that means there's a better chance, unless you've had a really bad injury that's explainable, there's a good chance that this could be an organ issue, in which case that's more of an emergent medical emergency. If you're having something wrong with your kidneys, you need to do something about that fast because that can kill you, right? So these are all things you don't want to take a chance with. Allergies can cause painful can cause pain. I had really bad allergies growing up. I used to have hives. I used to get, like my mouth, my tongue would swell. I had to go to the hospital on a couple of occasions to because I, I was always starting to block my airway. I've grown out of that, but but all of these are different types of inflammation of the body that can also lead to pain. All right. Any of those medical causes, anything that I mentioned there, go to the doctor. And the way that you would get a diagnosis is probably through blood test. You'd have to get a blood test, get your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone, get your free T4 and T3. You can get to check your blood sugar, your insulin level in your body for diabetes. You got to get blood tests for that kind of stuff. And this is something that a doctor needs to do. This is not something that a physical physiotherapist or an art teacher is going to help you with as far as that goes. So any of those medical, organ, hormonal, uh, uh, allergic, medical things are not what this video is about, but they could be a cause, so you want to be able to screen that out. If you get all your blood tests done and you check all your different organs and everything else is fine, but you're still getting really bad back pain or you're still getting really bad hip pain, maybe I can help you out with this today, okay? So... How do we test for mechanical problems of the body, movement, muscular bone issues of the body? Well, they usually do this in a couple of different ways. Number one, especially if you're going to see a doctor or a physiotherapist, would be what's called a provocative test, meaning to provoke a pain. So they might, if they want to check to see if it's a certain muscle, like your piriformis, if they want to see if it's your SI joint, if they want to see if it's your lumbar spine, and it's actually a, impacting a nerve, then moving your legs in certain ways, like if I try to bend forward, and if bending forward like this, going into a flexion movement, causes leg pain, very likely a disc issue in your back. As long as you keep your legs steady, if I'm not moving my SI joint, but I'm only kind of slouching into a forward flexion movement with my lower back, and that's causing butt or leg pain, or even further down the leg, we might be looking at a disc issue. You might want to go and get yourself an MRI, okay? And usually when it comes to disc, when it comes to disc issues, you want to get an MRI, not an X-ray. An X-ray is going to look at bones, but an MRI can look at discs and bones and tendons and all that kind of stuff as well. So it's a much more precise test. And for anybody who's afraid of MRIs, if you ever have to go see an MRI, it's really not a big deal. It's really not a big deal at all. You kind of have this relaxing video you can look at. The noises are nothing, nothing terrible, honest to goodness. I, I had an MRI and it was a piece of cake. It took about 30 minutes in and out, completely harmless. So don't worry about MRIs as far as that goes. I'd go for 10 in a row. You just don't want to do it too much because that's radiation, okay? So provocative tests. If I if I put certain pressure on my pelvis, on, on this part of my bone, and that's putting strain on my SI joint, does that recreate the pain, you're taught, you're communicating to your doctor. Can I pinpoint it right there in my pelvis by sticking my finger at it? And it's always in one side in one place. That's very, that's very possibly an SI joint issue. But if it keeps referring, it keeps moving around to different parts of the body, sometimes it's the legs, sometimes it's the knee and that, that might be more related to a disc, or at least that's more common of a disc issue. You can also do injections. So let's say you're dealing with chronic pain and you think it's your SI joint, well, you might go to the doctor and they might, they might inject a steroid into there, an anti-inflammatory uh, that's a stronger pain reliever right into the joint. And if that causes you immediate relief, temporarily, of course, then that's a way of diagnosing it. Because we know that by relieving the pain there, of course, my neighbor is going to do his lawn, his, his lawn now, like clockwork, <laughs> then there's a very good chance that that's an SI joint issue. But if you inject there and it doesn't make the pain go away at all, we're probably looking more to the disc in that particular case. The other thing can be stress. 
we can actually create pain in our body through hyper stress, through a lot of tr emotional trauma. So counseling can also be a very important route to take because a lot of people can deal with chronic pain, chronic digestive issues, weight gain, all by a heightened level of adrenaline in the body. And that, can, that has a bit of an inflammatory effect on the body, which can lead to body pain as well. So if you're somebody who's been through a lot of stress, but you're otherwise physically active and fit and flexible and strong and chronic bone pains is not an issue, maybe that's something to look into as well. Okay. Now, let's talk about the lumbar spine. I told you, I'm not taking it easy on you today. We're, we're, we're having a real lesson. So let's talk about lower back injury, lumbar spine injury. How does that happen? Well, right off the bat, it's very important to, to explain that your lower back, your lumbar back is not designed to be hyper mobile. It's not designed to like fucking clockwork. I swear to God, every single time. That's the street sweeper. Okay, so it's cool. I like street sweepers. They're cool. They're like they're like zambonis. I have no problem with them. So, your lumbar spine is not supposed to be hypermobile. It should be a relatively stable structure, and you want to be in a neutral spine position as much as possible. Yes, the lumbar spine moves. I'm moving it right now, right? But I don't want my lumbar spine to be taking all of the weight because I've only got small little muscles supporting my lower back. I don't have a lot of muscles supporting this area. So I don't want this bone to be moving too much. What happens if it's hypermobile? Well, if you look over here like this, you can see that if you're, if let's say if other muscles around that area aren't doing the job properly, then whenever I bend over to pick something up and it can be something as simple as picking up a pencil, it doesn't need to be weightlifting. It just, you can, you can lift this off the ground. It just requires that improper movement. You're moving and everything's fine and you feel perfectly fine and then it, Every single time you move and you're bending forward or you're slouching over your drawing table, you're doing this to the disc. You're pressing it down in a certain area. And if you keep doing it, keep pressing, keep pressing, keep pressing. One day you bend over to pick up that pencil and that happens like that. This is kind of representing a disc herniation. Those fibers of the disc split apart and some of that nucleus pulposa protruded out and that presses against a nerve. And if you want to know what that experience is like when it first happens to you, the first time I ever herniated a disc, I was probably in my early to mid 20s and I was filling a gas tank with gas because I, I, my gas tank had run dry. So I had to go to the gas station to get a, one of those plastic tanks. And the whole time I'm filling the gas tank, I was in kind of a slouched position because I'm a tall guy. Tall guys are more susceptible to herniated discs. So keep an eye out for that. I'm 6'3". So you're bending forward and you're filling it, filling it, filling it, filling it, filling it like this. And I was also dancing and doing twisting movements and tai bow and jive dancing, which is a lot of twisting like this and all kinds of shit on my back. And I was doing that and I ended up with a completely empty, empty tank. It was perfectly fine. And I walk into the front lobby of my house and I take this, honest to goodness, it weighed the same as this. It was weighed nothing. It was an empty plastic jug. Absolutely. It was like mostly air. And I bend down and I pick it, I bend, I, I bend down to put it on the ground. And when I went to get back up, it's like somebody took a metal post and went right into my back, right in there. It was like, Ooh! and I dropped down on my knees and I immediately burst into tears. It was the worst pain that I'd ever felt in my life. I didn't know what happened to me. I felt like I had been stabbed in the back. It is excruciatingly painful. And this was followed by months, of like at least weeks of acute pain, meaning that really bad, I can't move, I'm in terrible pain, I can't walk, I'm constantly groaning in pain to around six to eight months of tingling and sciatic pain in my leg that made it difficult for me to walk much longer than a block until eventually it started to go away, stuff like that. And back then, I didn't even know it was a disc herniation. You know what I referred to it as? Like most of us do. I put my back out, which really isn't specific enough. I had a herniated disc. This happened to my back. Every year, subsequently after that, come at time of shoveling, any twisting and flexing, moving, shoveling, raking, gardening, bending forward, changing the kitty litter, anything that required me to bend forward and twist at least once a year, especially during repeated movements like shoveling, shoveling's the worst. I would re-herniate my back, re-herniate my back. And I always recognized it. The way I would feel it after that was usually you'd get a spasm in your back that actually wasn't particularly painful. It was a warning shot, letting you know 
get ready, Adam. The next couple of months are going to be painful. <laughs> That's what that herniation, when you get a herniation, it's usually a, a spasm in your back. You get this kind of jerk. It's like something pulls your muscle. And the reason this is happening is because your herniation just went and hit a nerve and the surrounding muscles around your back went click and they flexed and spasm to protect it. That's basically what that spasm means. You can feel it up in your back here. You can feel it down your pelvis. You can feel it right at the root of that pain where the herniation actually happened. Usually around L3, L4, L5. That's usually where you're going to see it the most because that's the part of the body that is the most unstable that needs to be stabilized the most. And then, then it's just months of weeks or months of really bad pain followed by recuperation and rehabilitation, physiotherapists, doctors, blah, 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 blah. This kept going on for 20 years until around 19 months, 20 months ago, roughly at the time of this recording, where I had a herniation that was so bad, it didn't get better. And, and it was months, it was at least two or three months where I was in that acute, this is the worst pain of my life. I can't walk. I can't get out of bed. I can't move. That lasted months. I went to see a doctor. I got an MRI. And it was the first time they took an MRI and they said, yeah, you've got a pretty severe herniation at L4, L5, which means between the L4 and L5, that disc was like completely blown out. And I had moderate to severe disc degeneration as well. And I immediately thought, oh my God, I'm doomed. I don't know what to do. I'm doomed for the rest of my life. And I'm starting to think of things like spinal fusion, where they have to put pins in your back to hold your back in place and all that kind of shit. Pretty serious shit, you know? And and that's pretty serious back surgery as far as that goes. That said, after hundreds and hundreds of physiotherapy and spine surgeon and all these different types of things and getting little to no progress. Like my, my healing progress was about one to 2% per day. So every day I was around 2% better. So you can imagine that it's not only this chronic pain, but it wears down on your soul. It wears down on your mood and you can start feeling depressed. You can start feeling discouraged because you're thinking to yourself, you know, imagine what it's like to feel constant 24 hour pain, sitting, standing, walking, moving. You can't cross the street. You can't lie down. You can't do shit for six months, man, that, that wears down on your moods. So you, your sleep start, it goes to shit. You start looking really gaunt. Your, your adrenaline goes up. Your blood pressure can go up because being under high stress and high pain day after day after day after day after day for weeks and weeks and months and months causes your blood pressure to go up. It just does naturally. So you can see how that injury is not something to be taken lightly. And when I see how artists draw, when I see how they stand, when I see how they move, when I see that what the weaknesses and the, and the tightnesses that they have in their body, I get, person, I get personally bothered by this. I get triggered by this because I know what I, what I did wrong in my life and I can see people doing it to themselves. And then I look at online and I see some stupid video on the ergonomic chair and the ergonomic medicine ball and the yoga ball. And I go... Fuck you. Fuck you and your fucking money grab. Like, these are people that are in legitimate pain and you are monopolizing over this bullshit with some stupid empty promise of a healthy chair or a healthy thing. And all of that is mostly bullshit. Okay? Most of that's bullshit. So, yes, it's something that I take very seriously. So what kind of treatment treatments are out there if you find yourself with a herniated disc? If that happens to you? Well, well, first of all, I want you to understand how to tell the severity of something if it is actually herniated disc. The indication of a more or less herniated disc is how far that pain refers down the leg. Okay, so if you have a band of pain right across your lower back and it hurts like hell, it hurts like hell, but that's actually not the worst sign because it's very close it's very centralized. It's very close to the source of the pain. And that means that the impingement, the irritation of that nerve by that disc is minor. It's not the end of the world. But then usually it'll move into the butt. Usually the worst place you're going to get sciatic pain is right in the ass. It's right here in this, right in this area right there. That's where, that's where that exposed nerve is. So you feel uh, most pain there, but then as it gets worse and worse and worse, you might feel less pain up here. In fact, you might feel less pain overall but your thighs really hurt, your knees really hurt, your calves, as it goes below the knee, now we're getting more serious, you're going further down the route. That means that pressure, that irritation is worse and it's traveling further and further and further down the leg. You can get ankle and then feet pains, okay? All of those are indications that the herniation is worse. And as you heal, if you're doing the right thing, as you're healing, that pain 
will start to centralize. It'll be less referred, it'll be less distal, less far away from the source, and it'll start to move its way back up into the knee and the thigh, and then you'll only get the sciatic, but it's really bad. Oh, it hurts like hell, but at least it's it's coming back up to the source until eventually it just becomes a back pain, and then slowly but surely that back pain's gonna go away. This is a sign of healing, a herniation, okay? It might be a little counterintuitive because you might hurt more, but it's not as far down the lake. Now, when is a herniation a medical emergency? There's two major reasons why it'll be a medical emergency. Number one, if you have a complete blockage of the nerve, you can get what's called foot drop, which means you can't lift, if you're walking, your foot's dragging. You can't lift your foot up to heel strike. So you end up flopping your leg like that. And that the lack of strength is a good indication of a severe herniation. This is why if you ever go to a doctor's to check a herniation, They'll, he'll tell you to flex your foot and you'll put resistance against your foot and see how well you, how good you are at resisting that hand. And if it goes like this and there's no resistance, if it just, if one foot really can hold it back, but the other one just goes down like this, that might be an indication that it could be more severe herniation. Another thing to look at is bladder and bowel control. So these nerves are also controlling your bladder and your bowel. So if you're not holding in your bladder, that could be an indication of a herniation as well, unless it's something else, unless it's like post-childbirth or something like that, totally normal, okay? Or at least not a herniated disc issue necessarily, although you can herniate your disc during childbirth too, right? Um, so that's a way of kind of telling what's what. How do you tell if it's your lumbar spine or your SI joint. Well, I made this discovery because as of the last three months, I've had zero lumbar problems. Now I've been working towards healing an SI joint issue because once the pain of the herniation went away, I started to detect that it was a SI joint. And there were little clues that I'm gonna share with you, little clues that indicated the fact that this was an SI joint issue, okay? Number one is, I can, if the doctor says, where does it hurt? You go, it hurts right there. You're pointing at your ass right there, right where that joint is. It hurts there all the time. And it can be really bad too. An SI joint pain can be terrible. The reason why you'll get SI joint pain is number one, you can see that there's nerves passing back there. There's little nerves tucking in behind the SI joint right here. But also because that SI joint is a very hypomobile joint, meaning it should have little to no mobility, maybe at most, maybe a couple of millimeters, but it's not meant to be a joint that moves, and which is why we have many ligaments holding all of this together. It's not meant to move. But if you're thinking, if you're in some weird posture, if you're in this weird stretch and you're twisting your legs, or if you have certain weaknesses in the body that are not supporting that joint properly, then it can start to become hypermobile. And if it becomes hypermobile, even by a millimeter or two, too far, that can cause a lot of irritation and pain in the SI joint. And generally the pain you're gonna feel in the SI joint specifically, you can have a little bit of pain radiating down the outside of your leg. And what surprised me and helped me to diagnose the SI joint, self-diagnose that is, was outer calf pain. So the outside of your, the outside of your calves, you'll get a pain right there along that area too. Which I thought, that's associated with the SI joint? Yes specifically associated with the SI joint. If you're never sure, just look up SI joint pain pattern and it'll give you, it'll give you a picture of a, a human figure with little red marks on where the pain exists. I was very surprised because that's where I felt the pain too. And I thought because I was getting calf pain, oh, it's probably a disc issue. It can be, but in this case, I'm 100% sure it's an SI joint. And I even argued my doctor and physiotherapist about this. So I, I'm very clear on that. And since I've addressed my problem, through SI joint treatment, my SI joint pain is down to right now, zero. And I got a little bit of soreness in the morning, but otherwise I'm, it's, I'm really managing it well and I know how to do that. I'm gonna teach you how to do that as well, okay? So um, treatment options. Well, if it's an organ or something like that, there's medical. If you have hypothyroidism and you've got body aches and pains and you wanna take Synthroid or naturally desiccated thyroid, depending on where you're from, there's different treatment options for, for thyroid. Uh, you might wanna look into increasing your selenium. I, I always eat Brazil. I always have a, a spinach salad with blueberries and Brazil nuts that I actually buy on Amazon. They've got really good Brazil nuts on Amazon. And Brazil nuts are very high in selenium. You don't overdose in selenium because that can cause you cause thyroid storm, which is where your thyroid hormone shoots up from being overstimulated because selenium is what helps to convert thyroid hormone into the active version of, of T3. It starts as T4 and it converts into T3. So I take Synthroid and I, I make a point of having a little bit of selenium in my diet as well. Um, foods high in iodine, be careful with that, like seaweed for instance, be careful. That can also 
cause a fluctuation of th thyroid that can cause problems. So be weary about self-medication in that shit. Even dietary can be careful. Uh, physiotherapy. A couple of physiotherapists that I really recommend. One is Dr. Charlie Johnson, who I appreciate, whose videos I appreciated so much. I did a podcast on my channel with him, which you can go and check out. Um, I, what I really like about Dr. about Charlie Johnson is his psychological side and his listen to your body approach. It's not this by the book, do this stupid Bob and Brad exercise. I'm really not a fan of Bob and Brad at all. I don't want to call anybody out, but. I find them pretty useless in the big picture thing. You know, the old school by the book techniques that are outdated and don't work and actually counterproductive. He has this, uh, this approach towards healing that got me from that six months of debilitating pain to a very manageable state. He pulled me out of the fire, basically. So I have the world to thank for him. Um, another physiotherapist that gave me an ingredient and, and something towards there's the sweet street sweeper again, that gave me tips to overcoming it as well. A very important piece of advice was another YouTube channel called El Paso Manual Physical Therapy. And I'm going to share some advice that he shares. I really like his videos as well. El Paso Manual Physical Therapy. Really cool. Training, exercising, strengthening that respects how not to injure yourself. It's fucking mind blowing. How many people out there, physiotherapists and trainers, that are bad? They're bad. They don't respect the natural function of the movement. They teach glute exercises and body exercises that are so dangerous to the human body. I know from experience that I wouldn't recommend 75% of trainers out there, that these, these big buff guys or these girls in their little fucking Lululemon pants who don't know their ass from their elbow. Be careful with this shit. Reli a couple of reliable sources of fitness training. Athlean X, absolutely. Jo Jeff Cavalier, who happens to be exactly the same age as me because he was born in 75. Um, Christy Ennis, who kind of shares a little private YouTube videos where she does it on a yoga mat in her room. I really like her exercises. She really understands the functions of the body, particularly her ab exercises and her glute exercises are excellent. And another trainer that I really love, not only for training but for diet, is Eugene Teo who's a very celebrated Australian trainer, bodybuilding trainer and fitness trainer who really knows his science. And I really love that guy for that. So my first two places for physical training would be Christy Ennis and Athlete X. Then there's other ones that I, ha I have gone to see in osteopaths, which I found didn't really work for me personally. There's osteopathy, there's acupuncture, there's chiropractic. I personally really don't care for chiropractics. It sounds like a lot of witchcrafty bullshit that approach spinal things in a way that is, from a surgeon's perspective, complete bullshit. So I'm personally, I do not endorse chiropractic uh, uh, therapy, but to each their own. Uh, psychological physiotherapy, the psychological side of like Dr. Charlie Johnson and another person who I really like is the Huberman Lab as well. He's a very celebrated guy. I've been watching him for years. It was actually my tattoo artist, Julie Hamilton, who taught me about him. Yeah, she introduced me to him in the first place. Uh, I like physiotherapists that don't listen to common textbook advice, that are very intuitive, they're very humanitarian, they listen and they offer advice that makes you go, yeah, that makes sense. And not the kind of advice that, are you sure when I did that, that really caused me a lot of pain. I have been to at least, almost close to a dozen different physiotherapists that all gave me shit advice, that, that had me walking out of the physiotherapist's office in twice as bad a condition as when I walked in. The, all of the repairs that I did was from my own research, from listening to myself, from listening to physiotherapists that encouraged me to listen to myself, and by doing my own homework, which is what I encourage you to do as well. This is your homework today. Uh, therapy, if there's any kind of psychological issues you're, you're dealing with, and dietary because bad diet can wreak havoc on your body as well. Uh, so Dr. Berg is somebody I really love, albeit the keto thing, do your homework on keto. He's, he's, all, he's Mr. Ketogenics, and uh, I did the ketogenic diet for a little bit. I don't necessarily entirely agree with it. Some of his dietary advice is a little bit interesting, but I don't think he's bad at all. I think he offers a lot of very good nutritional advice. Eugene Teo as well, he's great for that. Athlinex. He's into high endurance sports and I find that his health advice, his diet is off the charts for me. I think that unless you're somebody who trains seven hours a day, the amount of calories that guy packs in and the amount of food that that guy packs in is like 
dude, I can't eat like that. So I wouldn't necessarily take dietary advice, but I would definitely take training advice from, from Jeff Cavalier, from Athlean X. Then there's medication. So there's NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil or Tylenol. There's steroidal injections, which is either done by a doctor through injection or it's done through, uh, through prescription. And then there's hormone. There's Synthroid, there's vitamins, there's antibiotics, there's probiotics, depending on if it's digestive issues and things like that. Um, something to be said about NSAIDs. And this is something that helped me to figure out and to diagnose the fact that I was actually dealing with an SI joint issue and not an impinged nerve problem. Did you know that Advil doesn't really address nerve pains? It's more for bone and muscle, musculoskeletal pain. Now, when I took Advil, my pain went away like that. I had a good night's sleep. My pain was relieved for eight, nine hours when I would take an Advil. Not that I recommend taking Advil too much because that can cause digestive issues and kidney issues and shit like that. I only took it when I was at my wit's end. But the fact that that actually helped significantly indicated to me we might be dealing with a bone and muscle issue. We might not be dealing with a disc issue anymore at this particular point. Okay, so that was a very good indicator, something to look into yourself. Okay, so how are we doing? An hour. All right, so how do you, if you're dealing with SI joint or lumbar problems, what is the most common issue? Well, you injure yourself. You fell off your bike and you landed on your ass. That'll definitely cause pains right there. But what if it's postural? What if it's day-to-day -day stuff? 99% of people who herniate their discs and cause this problem in the first place that lead to these hip and back problems is never some sudden acute injury. Like something, for instance, that happened to Keanu Reeves. He, you might not notice that he actually had a, 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 a dual spinal fusion, meaning they had to put rods in the spine to fuse two vertebrae together to prevent movement. Uh, dual spinal fusion uh, because he fell off a motorcycle, because he's a big cyclist. He, he, he owns arch uh, cycles, right? Uh, motorcycles, he fell off his bike and he actually had to get a double spinal fusion before the filming of Matrix. He spent the entire, he filmed the entire film of Matrix with spinal fusion he didn't tell anybody about. Okay. Yeah, that guy's a little bit off. The, it's Keanu Reeves. What are you going to do? He's Canadian, right? So there's that. But that's a very, very rare situation. More often than not, it's just stress. It's just day to day wearing and wearing and wearing and wearing and wearing until pop. Something goes wrong. It can, that wearing and tearing can be months, it can be years, it can be decades in the making. So why does this happen? Well, like I mentioned before, your lumbar spine is not meant to be hypermobile. You need to think about your, if you're thinking about your lumbar spine, I want this area around my spine to be hurry, supported, held in place. I want these ligaments and bones and vertebrae and discs to be supported by the surrounding muscle structures. And everything we do in modern life, which is, I'm sure you've heard it in ergonomics, you've heard these fucking videos about it, but they never explain it properly. Improper lifestyle habits lead to too much pressure being put on that disc until eventually it herniates. And um, you wanna prevent that from happening. So how does a sitting and an immobile or a slouching over posture do this to the body? Well, there's two different opposing forces, two different opposing things happening on the body from a musculoskeletal perspective, from the muscles and the bones. We can weaken certain areas by stretching. We can strengthen certain areas by exercising. And by holding ourselves in a seated position like this. Let me pull this off the rack, okay? I'm slouching over my desk like that, okay? So what am I doing? I'm stretching my latissimus muscles, all the deep muscles of my lower back and my rectus, rectus spinous and my QL muscles. They're in a constant state of stretch. And when we're drawing, when you're in the, the, the art zone, you're stretching for hours and hours and hours. So there's stretching which and that stretching is causing weakness in the body it's causing weakness in this area so there's nothing supporting it on that front on top of it all of the muscles in your not only that but look i'm also sitting so i'm also stretching my glutes 
my glutes are in a, if you're sitting right now, your glutes, your gluteus maximus are in a stretched position. So it's weakening them, weakening them, weakening them. You're, in order to strengthen them, you want to extend and flex your ass and hold these legs nice and steady. Okay, hold them up. But if you're sitting all the time, you don't need to. You've completely disengaged and you're in a stretched position with your glutes. So that's causing a weakening, a very massive weakening uh, uh, um, issue here in your lower back as well. That should be supporting this area of your lumbar spine, the area where we generally get herniations. On top of it, our gluteus medius are also in a shortened state. And if our gluteus medius that are on the outside of the leg are in a shortened state, that's reducing support laterally. The gluteus medius are holding here and think of it as two posing forces that are holding my pelvis in this direction. So that's getting weak, allowing loosening of the ligaments and the structure and, and can lead to hypermobility of the pelvis, which can also have an adverse effect on the lumbar spine as well. Um, on top of it, we're, we're getting tightnesses in other areas. Number one, our iliopsoas muscle. Remember we have an iliopsoas muscle that's pulling the spine in this direction. It's doing the iliopsoas, if I was to flex my iliopsoas, it's arching my lumbar spine like that. It's pulling it into this, into this ex hyperextended position, okay? And if I'm sitting, this iliopsoas is in a shortened state. And what happens when things are short for too long, if I'm sitting like this all day for hours and hours and hours, and it's like my all day I'm sitting down all the time, your muscles start to adapt to that shortness. Your muscle, your body's a learning organism. So if you're in a constant shortened state, it says, okay, my muscles don't need to be longer. And they do what's called adaptive shortening. So it becomes a tighter, shorter muscle because it's not getting stretched often enough. Okay. Your hip flexors, your TFL, your, your rectus femoris muscle, the muscle that goes straight down your leg right over your knee into your tibia. That's that muscle. They all get short and tight encouraging a flexed position. But you gotta walk, don't you? You gotta sleep, don't you? And when you sleep, you might wanna sleep on your back and stretch out. And what happens is you, by doing this, because I've got tightness here and I don't have enough supporting muscles in the back, like my, glute, my glutes and my gluteus medius and my lower back muscles, what ends up happening is by when I'm in a sleeping position, those muscles are tight. So it causes my, my back to start doing this because it's pulling down all the time, arching my back like this. This, by the way, is also referred to, if you're just looking at the tilt, the natural tilt of your pelvis, it's referred to as an anterior pelvic tilt. You might've heard this before. So anterior means towards the front, posterior means towards the back, towards the butt. So this would be a posterior pelvic tilt. This is an anterior pelvic tilt. And you can see how an anterior pelvic tilt is putting pressure and it's pushing, it's encouraging the disc to bulge out this way, which is end up going to cause a protrusion and it's going to lead to a, a rupture. Okay. Cause you're over pushing the disc in this direction. You might notice if you do have tight hip flexors, you might notice it when you're sleeping. And this is something I used to do all the time. I didn't even know why, especially when I woke up in the morning, I would wake up and I'd always have this urge to stretch my legs and flex and kind of extend my toes. I kind of like this ah, kind of stretch feeling with the legs. And whenever I would do that, I would notice that very often it would cause back soreness after. Well, the reason I'm doing this is because I've got type hip flexors and I, I, I need that satisfying stretch of the hips because my, my hips aren't extending properly. But by doing that, I'm putting a lot of pull on my iliopsoas and my front, which is forcing my pelvis forward. I've heard about the natural curve of the spine and anterior versus posterior pelvic tilt. I realized after teaching anatomy for years and after studying and seeing physiotherapy and having consulted with f multiple physical th f physiotherapists and doctors, none of them ever addressed the fact that I had an anterior pelvic tilt because different people have different tilts to a certain degree. But when I realized that I was doing this ever so slightly too much, my pelvis was too much, this kind of an arch in the back is too much of an arch, a natural lumbar spine should be much more neutral. It should be very gentle like that. That's a natural lumbar tilt. I thought this was. No, this is herniation territory. This is a nice straight back. You should feel a nice straight back like this. And the way, if, you're, if your body's in the right kind of shape, you should always feel like, imagine like you, your pelvis is kind of 
tipping back and forth. And if it's too far forward, you feel the strain. If it's too far back, you feel like your butt is tucking like that. You want to find that nice neutral space. But in my opinion, if you're somebody who sits a lot, favor going a little bit posterior. So favor doing this a little bit, which is, if you think about it, it's it would be the opposite of showing off your Instagram ass, right? Because normally, you know, <laughs> Instagram posture is this, right? This is the ass that goes up this way, basically. Um, it's the opposite. You're, you're, you're clenching the butt, okay? So, how do you prevent that from happening? Well, number one is the two muscles. I want you to start spinning daily daily exercise. I wake up at 6 a.m. every morning. I take my bike. I ride to the gym. It's around a 10 minute ride. And it, every day I'll have my regular weightlifting routine. But at the end, I go into this little private kind of big like track room, interior track room. It's nice and quiet. And I, I lie down on a mat. And every day I put a ton of effort and energy into working out my glutes and my lower abs. Doing bridges with a leg with, with bands so I can do what's called clamshelling. So I'm opening, I, I flex my, my butt and then I lift, I separate my knees to help really clench the, the that pelvic joint and really work out my butt and my lower abs as well. And this is where El Paso Manual Therapy comes in and where Christy Ennis comes in because they're the two, the only two people I've seen online that actually do it properly. They don't encourage hyper extension of the lower back. Most of them do. Most people train do bridges wrong. And the, you don't need a lot of movement in your ass to get a full flexion that fully supports your back. On top of it, you want to start doing stretches. Always start gradually, because otherwise you can actually cause injury, of your iliopsoas stretches, your, your rectus femoris stretches, and that'll also include a little bit of TFL in there as well, because they kind of work together as a team. They, they function together. And what you're going to notice is, by doing stretches of your hip flexors, you're gonna slowly start to relax the pressure on your pelvis, allowing it to go into, you're not gonna feel the tension pulling down. You're gonna feel like your pelvis is more relaxed. There's less pull on it. And you're activating your glutes. And I'm putting emphasis on the word activating, meaning you're encouraging strength here, which is also encouraging a little bit more of a posterior pelvic tilt. So what you're doing is you're bracing and holding this in place and you're also gripping onto the lower back and by working out your lower abs, look at the, this is something that a lot of doctors don't describe. Look how that pelvis, look at how that spine tucks deeply into the sacrum. It's tucking in a lot. Well, your lower abs are like a brace. They're like a girdle that are holding onto this. The way you can feel your lower abs is lie down on the ground and then pull your belly button in and flatten your back against the ground. You're trying to make a flat back. If you have a hard time doing that, if this, that's causing strain and it's hard, if you just lie down in a nice, natural, neutral lying on your back, supine, they say, if you're lying on your back and your back, whoop, naturally, your lumbar back naturally lifts off the ground, it's probably because you have tight hip flexors. And that's an indication that you need to stretch your hip flexors and that'll naturally allow you to relax and bring your spine down to the ground. This is also part of doing ab exercises. Check out Christy, Christy Ennis, uh, lower back and glute exercises. So essentially what you're doing is you're allowing the front to relax, reducing the tension, including your iliopsoas, reducing the tension on that lumbar spine, allowing it to relax, and then at the same time gripping and supporting it from the front, and your lower abs is gripping and holding in at the bottom. So you basically have this strong supporting girdle, holding the pelvis, holding the sacrum, holding the lumbar spine ugh, in place. So if you do any kind of bending over, any kind of forward leaning movement, all of that movement is, you can feel that you're bracing yourself before you lean forward at all, ever. So you know, just by the way you're holding yourself, that you are not, you are not potentially injuring yourself. And you never know where that injury is gonna come. Now I know if that injury is coming, I know it's not going to, because I'm never gonna let that happen again. I didn't know, 40, 47 years of my life and I didn't even know this. This is new shit that I'm sharing with you here. And if you do this repeatedly every day, what you're doing is you're slowly conditioning your body to be in this, what we call, the most important word of the day today, gluteal activation. This is what I learned from El Paso Manual Therapy. This was the key to unlock my healing. He had a video called, if you're not doing this, you're never gonna, you're never gonna heal your back. 
And I watched the video and what he said is, you can have the strongest butt in the world. And if you wanna know if you have a strong butt or not, just look in the mirror. <laughs> if you've got a flat ass, your, your ass is weak, right? And if you, the thing is, people wanna look like they've got a, a nice round butt by doing an anterior pelvic tilt. So you exaggerate the curve of the butt by sticking out your ass. But in fact, if you look at an athlete's ass, their back is nice and straight, their back is straight, but they've got strong glutes that create the roundness for them. So if you're looking at an athletic versus a show-offy posture, an athletic back or a dancer's back, for instance, because dancers are a good example. Ballet dancers always have perfect asses, right? You have this nice flat back, not like this, but a nice flat back with a nice round butt. This is what you're aiming to achieve yourself, okay? You want the butt to be the roundness, not the spine of it. And what he was saying in El Paso Manual Therapy was, it's not about glute strength. You can have great strong ass, no problem. It's glute activation. You have to keep it engaged, activated all the time. You're constantly conscious of your butt. You're constantly conscious of your lower abs. I'm sucking in my belly button and tucking in my ass, okay? Focus on that extension and stretching and essentially kind of gently weakening and lowering the stress on your, on your hip flexors and strengthening your glutes strengthening your latissimus muscles, pull downs like this, rows like that, every day. Do a couple of sets every day to kind of strengthen that. That's also putting a lot of support around here. Then gluteus medius, side lifts, okay? When you're doing side lifts, make sure that you're not leaning back. If you're doing side lifts, make sure that your hips are stacked one on top of each other like that. You don't wanna lean back a little bit or you're gonna end up working out your hip flexors. You wanna lean forward and work the gluteus medius and you'll know you're doing it right because you're gonna feel a pain on the outside of your ass, like that. And aim to do as many as you can. My guess is, it's not a muscle we work, a lot, work out a lot, my guess is you're gonna start feeling a lot of pain even as low as 15 to 20 reps. You're aiming for many though, aim for 100, but you're gonna see that it's gonna hurt a lot if you're doing it right. Um, even if you're somebody who's strong, gluteus medius are muscles that don't get a lot of attention unless you're a skateboarder and you're doing ollies every day, basically, right? So that's the structural side of things. I just want you to be focusing on that. So if you think about it, if any posture that's leaning you over like this is it's screwing up your neck, but it's really screwing up your back as well. And you're going to end up injuring yourself one day, picking up a pencil. You're going to, you're going to herniate your disc sneezing or coughing one day. Then there's the mobility and the ergonomics side of things. We're almost done. So bear with me. Thank you for sticking it out this far. Then there's the ergonomic side of things. And this is another piece of advice that's complete bullshit. What's a proper sitting habit? What's a proper posture for back health? Okay, back straight, shoulders back, sit, stick out your ass, sit bones. Okay. Now I'm now my now I'm in a good position and I won't get a back injury. Wrong. Uh, if I stay like this for six hours, I'm gonna cause myself a lot of problems. Okay. Proper back health does not mean staying in this hyper straight posture that creates stiffness in the muscles, that leads to pain and also fatigue. So you, what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up doing this eventually, aren't you? Right? Because you can't sustain that. You're gonna end up leaning on one arm. This is something else to avoid because then you start to create what's called lateral shift. So you end up shifting your spine sideways. And that's what I did a lot. I used to lean on my, I got tired. So I would lean on my armrest like this. No, you don't wanna do that either, okay? Um, uh, what you want to do instead is move. So sit straight, lean forward on your arms for a little bit, slouch a little bit, move a little bit, but be conscious and move when you're sitting. Don't just sit in a static position. You want to move. Why? Because the brain's smart. The brain's smart. This is all part of healing. When you move, when you're active in a certain part of your area, your body, you're basically sending a signal to your brain saying, oh, that part of my back is important. This part of my body is important. Send fluids, fluids and nutrients and, and anything that the body needs into that area because it's an area that gets use. When you, not, when you don't use something, you end up creating an atrophy. You end up creating a weakness in a certain area because the body basically is saying, so, well, he doesn't need that part, so just fuck it. If you're sitting all day, you're basically saying, my back isn't important. Don't, my butt's not important. Don't worry about them. Send your energy into your thumb muscles so you can draw better. And that's the, the, only, the only muscle in your body that gets any real attention is your brain and your thumb. Okay, this is why you end up with carpal tunnel syndrome from overworking your wrists so much. So um, mobility, get up 30 minutes, 45 minutes an hour, get up, walk around. I have a sit-stand desk. I teach two-hour sessions, private sessions every single day. 
okay? I spend half of that class on my ass, I spend half of that class on my feet. I do both and both because if I stand for too long, then my feet and my back start to get sore a little bit. So sometimes I need to rest my back and sit down. And then I stand up again after that. So I'm constantly changing positions. Go for walks. Don't drive all the time, okay? Use your bike. I, I've, been, I've been beefing up my bike and adding, buying some cool accessories for my bike because I find that biking really helps with my pain as well, okay? So um, uh, ergonomics and health is about mobility. It's about teaching the body that this part of my body matters. Send resources to it. If you've ever been through surgery, back surgery, hip surgery, any kind of surgery, if you've had really bad back pain, they always tell you, once that acute phase of pain is gone, get on your feet and start moving. Because if you don't, you're never going to fucking heal. If you want to heal from a herniation, if you lie in your bed for three weeks, that herniation is never going to go away. You have to get up and move. And even if it hurts a little bit, not too much, then you have to say, okay, I'm going to do a little bit every day and just kind of teaching my body mobility. And it's going to try its bits. That'll help in the healing process. Lots of fluids. Why do we drink water? Well, it makes your skin look good. It helps to detox us. It helps to clean out minerals. It helps to prevent kidney stones, especially if you put a little bit of water in it because that can dissolve calcium, right? Lemon citric acid can dissolve calcium. I got that piece of advice from Dr. Berg. Drinking fluids also, think about your bones, your arteries, your nerves, your, 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 your muscles, your vertebrae, your discs have water in them. So if you're dehydrated all the time, those discs degenerate. Makes sense, doesn't it, right? So you get you end up with disc degeneration from lack of mobility in your body. So adding fluids helps to cr encourage the cushion. I get it. I've got a nice big one and a half liter or is it maybe even two liters. I drink that every day. Don't overdrink. Don't drink 16 liters of water a day. You can end up depleting your body of nutrients. It's called hypovitaminosis. You're expelling too much and your body starts to starve for nutrients. So drink a healthy amount for your size and your weight and your sex and all that and your activity level. It's very important, but drink water every day. What else contributed to my disc degeneration? I smoked for 20 years. How does smoking degenerate your disc? Well, is it water going in there or is it some other fucking chemical that's eating away at the disc? Makes sense once you understand that this is not just bones and cushions, this is liquids that also make up this process as well, okay? So that's a dietary thing and all that. I'm not going to get too much into diet. Uh, why did I make this video? To exhaust you with the truth and to let you know not to take your body for granted. And as an artist, if you're hunched over like this and you're gripping onto a pen every day, if you're slouching and pinching your neck, if you're leaning on your armrest, if you're sitting on your ass, if you're not walking every day, if you don't go and exercise to the gym, if you only go to the corner store once a day to buy smokes in your car, stop it. Go buy smokes on a bicycle. And then don't go buy smokes on a bicycle. Go to the gym instead later on, but baby steps, right? Take care of yourself and understand, uh, be visually aware of the weakening and the tightening that is happening in your body that's causing pain in your body that's leading to long-term injury. I'm 50, I intend to live to 150, and I expect you to do the same thing. And if you don't, if you abuse your body every day and you, you take it for granted, this is what ends up leading to problems that are gonna completely impact your life. Because remember, if you're immobile, if you're in chronic pain, you stop moving, your blood pressure goes up, you start getting depressed, you start getting anxiety. It's not just your back, it's your life, okay? So I want you to take that shit seriously. I love you. I'm going to shut up now. Go take care of yourself. Take care.